So, my friends didn't come back for the last film and I think you don't want me to comment upon an interview that I was doing myself, so the last uh, video will be without commentary. I'm Kai Arne, CEO of the MariaDB Foundation, and for this session, I'm interviewing Sergei Golubchik, Vice President of Engineering for MariaDB Server. Welcome, Sergei. Thanks. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. So this interview is about the MariaDB 10.7 preview releases, the goals behind them and how it was implemented and what the lessons from them were. Now, I think you are the father of this preview release idea, aren't you, Sergei? Well, I wouldn't say that. There was lots of people involved in, well, designing and implementing this thing. Uh, so if, I don't know, if you would think about it as a Avalanche, then I was the one who was thrown the first snowball, but then it was definitely not only me, it was a collective effort. Okay, so you threw the snowball on this one. So I will ask you about your role, uh, which explains to the audience why you were the one throwing the snowball, but let me first set the stage a bit by pointing out our earlier communication on this topic, and by our, I mean Marie Foundation. Uh, so uh, that background is two basic blogs and eight feature blogs on the preview releases from roughly two months ago. Those are not required reading in any way for this session, so you will, you will get a summary of them. Uh, but we will also look at how this experiment worked out, since we now have two months of experience from the preview releases. Uh, the, pre the big picture of the idea was presented in a series of two blogs in September, challenges and visions for MariaDB server and 10.7.0 comes as preview releases. And then we had eight detailed blogs and I will briefly mention them too also for two reasons. So one, we don't want to be too abstract in this session and uh, hence go into concrete issues. But also while we're at it, we also want to promote the features of MariaDB 10.7 as I think they are quite exciting. So there's eight of them. The first one was UUID data type. And there's a blog about these universally unique identifiers by Daniel Black. Now, number two is natural sort. And natural sort means that a string A10 comes after A9 and not like it would in alphabetical order between A1 and A2. And there's an uh, Anil Husakovich blog on that. The third one is about compression provider plugins loading compression libraries on request at runtime, and that's by Robert Binder. And then there's JSON histogram, to which I think we will return here. That's an optimizing feature, a blog by Vicenzo Ciorbaro. I had the pleasure to write a blog about Python-like string formatting. Uh, so that's the S format, curly brackets type of, of uh, string formatting, and that was the fifth one. The sixth is uh, a blog you wrote, Sergei, about convert partition, and that's a convenient and crash safe alter table syntax for partitioning changes. And then there was um, a password reuse check plugin blog, uh, which is about MariaDB forcing new passwords to be new by Ian Gilfillan. And the last one uh, out of the eight blogs was written by Eric Herman, our chairman. Uh, miscellaneous features. One of them, he was very much involved in himself. That was JSON equals, so that you can uh, compare whether JSON strings, which are uh, from a literal as, as a character-based uh, interpretation, they might be different from, but from a JSON perspective, they should equal each other. So, so that's it. That, that, that's, that's the background, uh, backdrop that we have for this interview. So now let's go into why you, Sergei, uh, is the person that I'm interviewing about these preview releases. So I've always thought of you as a bit of an eminence grise, uh, a great eminence working behind the scenes with, for example, Monty visible uh, to everyone and, and, and highly, 
highly vocal, but you've been responsible for some of the most important decisions since 10 years before MariaDB even started. So, so um, your title is, is uh, Vice President of uh, Server Engineering, but what's your role within MariaDB Foundation? I'm a board member of MariaDB Foundation. And uh, what does that mean, for instance, when it comes to code contributions? It has absolutely nothing to do with code contributions. No, I mean, your, I mean, your, I mean, your board role. My, my, in my role as a board member of MariaDB Foundation, I do absolutely nothing with uh, contributions. I did, that but in true, a different but, role. So in what, in what capacity do you, uh, yeah, are you involved in, in code contributions? So, um, well, I love uh, community contributions. I think it's very important for MariaDB to have a thriving uh, de developer ecosystem with developers. And uh, for example, I participated in Google Summer of Code as a mentor since like 2008. But so I always wanted uh, MariaDB well, to support, to work well with uh, contributors. And because we are now on GitHub, it was mostly about pull requests and maybe five years ago or something. That's when I started and it's a rule that every pull request should be answered, well, should get the first answer in within a given reasonably short time frame. It doesn't mean it will be completely accepted within this, but it should definitely get some attention. And there was a set of a procedure a process how to handle them. And we had a dedicated developer, Sergey Wojtovich, who was, well, besides many other things, was making sure that every pull request gets a needed amount of attention. And I imagine it might have been not fun every single time, but it worked uh, very well and it paid off. We have number of pull requests, it grew. We got a very active developer community, but that was, and now I don't do anything with contributions at all. It's completely on MariaDB Foundation and MariaDB Foundation developers. So I'm, I don't, I'll, uh, so what about the similar yeah, the, excuse me? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I, I was going to ask a similar question around your relationship to Linux distributions. Uh, I, I suppose the general tone of your answer will be the same, but I, I'm interested in your personal thinking and yes. your uh, relationship to Linux distributions. Yes, and uh, the answer will be completely different. I don't have, I don't never had any role as far as Linux distributions are concerned. I do occasionally communicate with uh, MariaDB maintainers in various, various Linux distributions when we are discussing uh, distribution specific bugs in MariaDB or something like packaging or for example, security issues that security teams in those distributions very much want to know about, but that's it. So I have very little role dealing with. So with all that background, uh, Linux distributions, uh, uh, foundation corporation and code contributions, I think you have a, um, a bit of a challenge uh, answering this question when it comes to what kind of a constituency, constituency you, you, you represent. So I think it's fair to say that you represent both the community, the foundation and the corporation, but what's your take on that? Well, uh, I'm an employee of Marie for Corporation. Uh, they pay my salary and my goal is to do what's uh, best for Marie Corporation. But uh, so that's, but I uh, deeply believe that uh, having a successful MariaDB server project and which is used everywhere and a thriving developers community is what's best for MariaDB corporation. So that's what I'm doing. So there's no contradiction here. I just uh, do what I believe in. So then let's turn to the first blog, the challenges and visions for MariaDB server. So not all of the items in that blog are related to the 10.7 preview uh, releases, but since I have you here available to answer questions, I'd like to ask some uh, things about the other items. And first on that one, uh, continuous integration. 
So one pain point, pain point uh, pointed out there is the state of the development tree, where we uh, confess that we're not yet in a situation where the MariaDB server tree always passes all tests on all platforms, but we're working on it. So can you comment uh, briefly on that one? Yes, so we used, uh, we used Billboard as our SCI and for the, we have, and we have Billboard that works for like for the last maybe 10 years. And for the, and recently we've, in, we are installing, configuring a second Billboard, a much newer version on billboard.mariv.org, which is, uh, where the chains and Vlad from MariV Foundation are working on. And the goal is to have this one, to use this one in a way that ensures that, well, the tree is always green, that things that breaks tests or does compile never gets even pushed into trunk. But we are not there yet, we're just, it's work in progress. Mm -hmm. So every developer, every contributor should be able to uh, rely on the main development branch to work so that the bugs they uh, encounter when developing is theirs only. So when I contribute and I find a bug, it's my bug, not that of somebody else. Any any comment on that? No, besides, yeah, yeah, I agree totally. So there's nothing to comment on that. Good. So, so then about something that clearly touches more on the 10.7 preview releases. We say it's difficult to predict when a feature will be ready. Users are always asking for three things that are somewhat mutually exclusive. Features by a deadline without bugs. So we will inevitably have to strike some compromise between these three. So what's in your mind the right priority order for features, deadline, bugs? Well, I wouldn't really want to prioritize, but I also agree with users. We also want features at a right deadline on the right schedule without bugs. But yeah, but actually, but if the feature isn't ready, then, well, it's not ready. We cannot, uh, I cannot just will it to be ready. It still needs time to be well implemented. So if it's, that's nothing to do about it. If it's not done, it just needs time. That's, that's how it is. And uh, note that a new feature, there might be, I don't know, tens of hundreds of thousands of users waiting for the new feature. But on the other hand, there are, MariaDB has many millions of users and many of them rely on MariaDB being released on a, well, predictable schedule. And uh, furthermore, it's, it's snowballing from there because if we don't want to release in time, then it will not get into a specific Linux distribution. And those Linux distributions have many, even more, even many more users will get affected. So that's why we are trying to, well, by making those choices, we're trying to well, make it inconvenient for as few users as possible. So that basically means releasing on schedule. Mm -hmm. so, so the pain point in agreeing uh, whether it's a time uh, based or feature based thing you're saying it is it is uh, time based and and there's there's this analogy some people use about the train model that the train leaves the station and uh, meaning a release is done at a certain time and then the train doesn't wait for individual passengers who who might miss the train uh, meaning some features may be missing so we say that that uh, missing a train is expensive which sounds like a no brainer so why hasn't MariaDB always done that? Or has MariaDB all, all days always done that? No, we started doing that in the last mm, six, maybe years. Seven so, years. so then uh, time-based releases must have some drawbacks. So what are those? Well, uh, if you use a train model and the train leaves a schedule, then you always risk that the train will leave, you know, half full. And if you are particularly unlucky, unlucky, it might leave even almost completely empty. This is not good for the company who's running the trains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They want to sell as many tickets as possible. So then That's why true. don't we have more frequent trains? Can we just not increase the number of train departures? I suppose you will say that has uh, drawbacks too. Yes, because, well, train, the train, they 
consume some kind of fuel and they are also not cheap to run. And as far in a good going away from train uh, back to releases, then releasing too often again has its own costs of there's a cost in doing the release, there's a cost in maintaining the release. So we are trying to balance that. So that then gets us to the, the uh, idea of 10.70 coming as preview releases. So uh, some of those concerns you thought could be solved using preview releases. So let's turn to the thinking from that blog and also from the eight detail blog. So we defined one challenge as making MariaDB mature quicker. So in which way was the experiment with several parallel preview releases of MariaDB server 10.7 um, addressing this challenge of making MariaDB mature quicker? Well, that was, it was actually addressing it on many different levels, but for example, so how we did it before, we had our feature branches that when features already got merged into the trunk, then we release the trunk as MariaDB something alpha version. And then it's over the series of releases, it gets matured until it gets well production quality. And the risk always is that there's some particularly unlucky, bad designed or buggy feature. And the whole trunk can mature only as fast as the worst feature in the trunk. And so now with the preview, what we did with preview releases, we released a preview binary from every feature branch without merging it into a trunk. And then there were six weeks of internal testing to see how good the feature is and to somehow get a feeling of how fast it'll mature. And only after that, after we were reasonably sure that all the, all the, feature, that the feature is good enough, then it gets merged into the trunk and then we release it. Together is one or MariaDB binary with all the features. Mm -hmm. So uh, one reason for doing that is that, uh, well, I believe that we uh, uh, there were two reasons for doing that then. What one is the congestion of merge hassle happening just before the release. That's an internal thing. Uh, but then you also mentioned this uh, preventing um, that, that if there's one feature that is not good enough, then it's like the, the one bad apple is not uh, contaminating, causing the whole basket to, to rot. Uh, and that would then mean that such features would not make it into the first normal merged release 10.7.1. Was that the idea? Yes, and this has actually happened. One of the features that you mentioned earlier, it did not make into the release because it didn't, well, it didn't pass the quality checks and which actually proves, which it's said and uh, in a sense, but also it shows that we are serious about the quality. And if the feature, even if you has shown the features of preview release, but it didn't uh, make the quality check, then we do not add it to my and so on. It's so then it, uh, one it was the new chance whenever 10.8 uh, will happen, I suppose. Yes. it's if it will get to a minimum required stability level, maturity level, then it will get into the next release. Mm -hmm. And 10.7.1 uh, has appeared as well. And it was, if I remember correctly, declared, declared release candidate, RC. Uh, now, what was the logic behind, behind that, such an early release with, with uh, such a, a mature term? Yes, because we skipped alphas and we did preview releases. They went out with basically alpha quality. Although as later testing has shown, they were much, many of them were better than alpha. And then we've spent uh, six weeks for every feature on internal testing and we found and fixed uh, no less than 50 bugs in all those features before adding them to the trunk which was pretty much equivalent to what we had before on all those life cycles from alpha to beta and over to RC. So that's why the features that were added to the trunk and to the RC actually 
they were much better than we usually push into the trunk, much more stable, much more mature because of this not uh, random testing in the wild, but actually targeted, targeted testing per feature. And those bugs that we found, there are bugs that were ne never present in any of the releases, the bugs that none of our users will ever have to face. And the result we thought that the, the server is mature enough to be, well, close to what we could release as production. That's why it's called release candidate, because it was a candidate for the release eventually. Okay, so so I think that's that's the logic behind 10.7.0 and 10.7.1. So it seems like you're quite happy about how the experiment worked out. Is is that is that the case? Yes, I think in my opinion it went pretty well. Lots of bugs were found. Uh, features were that got pushed were much better than well in previous MariaDB releases. Uh, that got pushed merged into the trunk. They all got go to the same, they all got to be production quality by the time of the J release. But this time, but this time we can get to J much sooner because of this restructuring of efforts. And so yes, I think it was working pretty well. Excellent. That's that's good news. So, anything else you you wish to highlight on ten point seven? I mean, what's your favorite feature in ten point seven? Or do you have one? Mm, well, of course, for me as a developer, favorite features would be features I was personally involved in. I think the one that I like the most is it's not very visible to users, but it's the one with provider plugins, because we always had this, say, dilemma. So we had a numerous uh, compression algorithms inside the server for InnoDB, for, well, earlier in, for TokyoDB as well, for Marunga, and for RocksDB. And the problem is that pretty much no user in the world, or almost no user, would need to use all of them. But on the other hand, there are definitely users who use every single one of them. So we cannot remove any of them because some users would, will be affected. But no user needs all of them. But on the other hand, because of this, because we have to ship them all, every user will need to install all the libraries for all the compression algorithms one will never ever use. And this is pretty much sounds like an unsolved problem, unsolvable problem. And in 7 we have solved it. That's what I like about solving and that's a good story problem. and that's a good solving reason why it's problem. yes. No, I was just saying that solving and it's a good reason problem for to be nice. your favorite or favorite uh, feature. It's not just because you yourself were were involved. So that's the good one. Hey, uh, anything more you you wish uh, us to say on ten point seven or the release model? No, wait for the next release. We hope it'll be good enough to be made. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot, Sergei Golovchik, for this. Thank you. So, thank you, Sergei Golovchik, for that. I managed to still get hold of my boss, the chairman, Eric Horman, and uh, we're down, down here for a discussion about what the MariaDB Foundation plans to do next year, 2022. So, Eric, how do you think that this Friends episode went with our commenting? Uh, I think it's great that we're experimenting with uh, how to work in a world where we're doing more online. I'm going to guess that some of them are going to work and others are not going to work as well, and we're going to learn something in the process. So, my suspicion is that uh, this is a first iteration and uh, some of it will be fun, some of it will be rough, but I think it'll, I think it'll be good. I, I will learn. We will learn and I think we were commenting a bit too much. I think we will have to shorten it in, in the future, but I think that the concept of such might work and I'm looking forward to the feedback from, from our uh, community. Yeah. What we're here to do now is, is to take a look at our 
uh, current draft of the aspirational goals uh, for 2022, yeah. which we have in our respective hands, and this might or might not be published. We haven't really made up on our, our minds on, well, on that. It's a draft. So. It is a draft. <laughs> yeah. And, and some of it was initiated by you. Some of it uh, was things that I have thought of for a long time, and we also got external input here. Mm -hmm. So, so I think we should have a discussion about what these these uh, aspirational goals are. And can you, you were the uh, father of the term aspirational goals. So, what what do you mean by aspirational? So, I, I wanted to get us talking and thinking about uh, what we could achieve if we had not just the resources that we have today, but if also more resources arrive. So, so I wanted us to think about things that were not so far into the future that they were, oh, this is a dream of 10 years from now, but things that would, some of these things probably aren't really achievable in 2022 because they would require uh, more, uh, more funding for that, but they're things that, that that we really could make meaningful progress on, um, maybe even with the funding that, that exists today, but certainly if, if more were there, and and to get us thinking about uh, how we can advance the mission more, and and what we, what would that actually look like in terms of of things that we should be working on. And I like that very much, and I think what. Uh, what it makes possible is is a certain level of creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, anybody who is being held accountable for all their goals will be a bit sandbagging and, and cautious, of, exactly. and not 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 be too creative about what could perhaps be done. And now I I also from as the CEO I, I felt free to write stuff that I think would be great to have uh, without then. Uh, at the end of the year, hearing so, Kai, how did you do on on goal A one dot four? Can you explain? Yeah, yeah. So, so let's then move on on to this. They are separated into three areas: openness, adoption, and continuity. And it, those are the three words that that we have used to abstract our our mission. But they are the sort of not inventions by you or me. They, they, they have been there all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we've just used them as, as, as coat hangers for, for, for concepts. Yeah. And within openness, the, the, uh, the first one is a complex of, of a number of issues around the foundation staff to act as contribution process role models. And that, that's something that, uh, We've been discussing a long while, but but you've been a, a prime initiator of it. And let me try to represent how I believe uh, that you want this this process to be uh, improved, and then you can correct me. So so one key here is to mature the code commit process so that internally we behave as we expect externally our contributors to to to, to behave. And, and perhaps that to be a role model for others, so uh, uh, such as the, the, the corporation, at least as a test bed for whether the Marie Corporation wants to follow the same GitHub pull request steps as any outside contributor would do, and the same with the review process. So, so any comment on that? Um, uh, yeah, sure. So I think that uh, one of the things that that uh, if if you uh, uh, follow your own process. Uh, you get first-hand experience with what are the parts of it that are rough, what are the parts of it that, that need improvement, and so uh, so by actually being a, a user of the process, uh, then uh, we will better understand what we're asking uh, people to do that, that are not in the foundation, um, that don't have commit rights directly to, to the GitHub repository. Um, so we'll be able to improve that experience for uh, for all contributors. So we're eating our own dog food on, on, on that. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Um, and, and I think that that, that process uh, will almost certainly cause um, uh, a little bit of rethinking on uh, on how, how should we be doing this? Should we be doing more of something or less of something? And uh, and I expect probably the first thing we'll see is the uh, the the template will probably get 
um, uh, a head scratch, something, something uh, uh, more thought about with that. Uh, and I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying that by looking at it every time, uh, that people will have ideas, and and that will be the first natural place that will that will see that. So one idea that that I got here is that. Uh, there's of course internal resistance to this. If, if this had been a no-brainer, we would have followed the process internally all the time. And, and, and one type of resistance is that, well, GitHub pull requests, they are for asynchronous communication, but since we are in, in the same organization within the foundation, it's so much quicker if we just have a video conference or happen to be in the same place like Vicenzo and Monti are, are here today. And, and, and that face-to-face -face process uh, is so different yeah, from, from, from yeah. a pull request. So, uh, how, any comment on that? Right. So, so I think that, that, uh, it, it would be unreasonable to expect that, that everybody would a hundred percent move to that right away. I don't think that's, I don't think that that's likely. But also, I think that, um, if, if I happen to, to, uh, have, have a pull request open and, Maybe I, I get guidance from you over Zulip or maybe a, a, a Jitsi call or whatever video conference call um, that the the extra burden of me summarizing that in a few sentences on the uh, uh, on, on the open pull request hopefully isn't too high of a burden. But I think I think we learn about that. Uh, and this is really about about learning. So yeah. So true. yeah. So externally, we have a goal of increasing the number of contributions, uh, maturing the external contribution process, meaning we now have a certain number of open pull requests. It was a while ago, it was 92, and we've put some effort into it. It's now, I believe, 79. Yes. Uh, and uh, lowering that number is, yeah. I think, a fair goal. Right. And I think that also uh, uh, something that may not be well understood, and it certainly isn't well understood by me in that number, is how many are open, but uh, the the request is waiting on the original contributor compared to uh, how many are open and waiting on review from a subject matter expert that hasn't been able to, to take the time yet. And so, uh, so I don't want to drive just towards pulling that number to zero, uh, I, I want to make sure that that we are uh, looking at each of them and and giving each the appropriate care, which may not be to close it. It may be to invite another round of work. Mm -hmm. So let's move to adoption, and 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 here our goal is to expand the outreach into user uh, communities. Now here comes my first pet idea. Uh, and, and I'm excited about it, and, and I want to share the excitement with those who, who, who watch our video, but I want your comment then. So, uh, create human language specific landing pages and video versions of them in 10 languages. So, slash ru for Russian and uh, fr for French and de for German, and we've listed a number of languages here. Chinese, Japanese, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, Swedish, Finnish. That's just a working list. And it's 10 of them. And that would have the top level information on MariaDB server. Like if you want to read about MariaDB server on one page, because you need to convince somebody else that we should use MariaDB for this, then it's going to have a bigger impact if it is in your own language. And if there's an accompanying video on it. And, and I'm excited about this, but what about you? Yeah, well, so what I like about it is that, uh, in terms of adoption, it, it opens the door for a first level read, uh, or a first level view if it's video, uh, from, from somebody that might be considering the product in a way that is easier than if they have to, uh, read or listen in, uh, something that is a language that they're not, uh, uh comfortable in. And so, uh, I think that's, that's really quite nice. And another thing I like about it is that it happens to be measurable. We will be able to, to get some insight into how much that's being, uh, how, how often these pages are being loaded, how many different uh, people are coming to see them, and that will give us guidance to how much more does it make sense to, to do. Is it just the landing pages, or do we need to really think about investing in more languages, in deeper content into the site? 
Um, and, and I think that, that we can make those decisions based on data that we're collecting. We will get objective data. And, mm -hmm. and I think in IT, everybody thinks that, well, everybody knows English anyway. But we know from our videos that uh, content producers that are really knowledgeable in MariaDB uh, need subtitles sometimes even more than I do. Uh, I'm not a native speaker. And, and, and I think us non-native English speakers are in a majority. And, and we have several levels of, of uh, uh, comfortability with, with, with English. Mm -hmm. So moving on then on these land, uh, landing pages, there's uh, two other ideas on, on, on landing pages, and they are specifically in English. And as you say, uh, if we get objective data, that language versions are, are interesting and, and specific landing pages in English are, are important, we might extend it, but that's not amongst our even aspirational goals yet. So one would be programming language specific English landing pages with uh, dash Python or, or dash uh, Perl or whatever language. We haven't listed that. I did list the, the 10 human languages. And that would contain the basic information that is relevant if you're coming from a Python environment. Mm -hmm. The videos and the, the, the uh, um, connectors and the articles and, and, and all of that. And, and hopefully the, the, um, the get up and running quickly and easily showing how you can use this and that uh, my hope would be that, that uh, it would make experimenting for the first time uh, super easy, that you can just docker up some stuff and then away you go or similar, uh, but something that's, that's very easy to follow uh, follow along with and see, no problem, I write this Python program and here I have hello world from the database. Mm -hmm. You were slightly less, uh, to put it mildly, impressed by the idea that we would do a similar type of, of landing pages for people considering should I use product A or uh, should I use, use Maria DB, like a comparison page with being MySQL or Mongo or, or Postgres. Yeah. Now, why are you less impressed or less <laughs> eager about that? Well, uh, I think, uh, first off, uh, uh, the, uh, the ability to be objective is, is really, really hard there. So, so uh, even, even knowing and being fully disclosed that yes, we're, we're biased in favor of, of, our, uh, uh, of our own approach, of our own solution, um, uh, it, I think it would be really, really hard to provide uh, an objective um, thing that uh, that that even even the the the, the other product, even FooDB, that the the people from FooDB would say, "Oh, yeah, that's fair." Well, I, I don't uh, want the FooDB. That my central goal is not the uh, the FooDB zealots to to think, "Oh, that's really great." Uh, um, uh, I would rather want uh, people thinking about FooDB and, and uh, MariaDB to, mm -hmm. to get some pointers relevant to their conundrum of should I pick Foo or, or, or MariaDB. But I, I, I have given up. I will not convince you here uh, dur during this, this presentation. I, I will perhaps make an experiment with some, sure. uh, some FooDB and let's see if, if you change your mind. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the way to do it. Is that let, let's, let's, see, let's see one example and see if... Uh, if if it is done in the way that that is uh, that's honorable, it's not trash talking, which I know is not the intent. Uh, but but see that it, it would be perceived uh, uh, well, and 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 I think once we have an example to work to look at and work from, uh, we can think about is this something that that we want to uh, invest more in. I do think that there are many cases where Maria is better than FoodDB, but I have to confess. Con con uh, uh, confess that FoodDB can can be better in some circumstances. <laughs> yes, exactly. So uh, then another goal that we have is is to establish a new model for the hybrid world we, we, uh, of, of of online and face to face. So you never know exactly how the pandemic will will uh, uh, continue, but I do think that that people are longing for for face to face uh, meetings like we are having now. Um, and sharing, we're not sharing beer, we're sharing, sharing water, at least today. Uh, and and uh, there also will be people who don't want to travel. I mean, we've, we've 
seeing the benefit of not having to stand in a queue and not having to uh, pollute the, 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 the climate. And, and uh, we've, we also want to pick raisins, like instead of going to one conference uh, and spend uh, all of your energy on that one, you, you can go to five conferences and just pick the raisins. So there are benefits to both. And I think we have to find a solution where, where you can get the best of both worlds, both as a, as a presenter and, and as, above all, as a, as a participant. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that, the, uh, that what we've seen so far, we've already learned some things about what, what works in online and some of the things that are challenging in online. So, so we're, we're already seeing some experience there that is uh, shaping the thinking. Um, and also we have, uh, I, we don't have to only look inward. We can look to see, uh, a, a FOSDEM, I think is a, is a great, uh, uh, place to look for, uh, things that have worked and things that have not. Um, and, and so I think there is, a, a real sense and real value in, in trying to continue to experiment with bridging the, the hybrid in person distance uh in person world um uh and also the the online world so i think i think if we can work on that um uh that, that will pay off uh we're also trying to identify uh, the best ways of, of doing developer adoption so like the landing pages is one of them uh, improving the documentation i think that's that's something where we would want as in, in an aspirational way put more resources on on uh, good infrastructure for, for, for the knowledge base and good uh, more, more, more content. And, and uh, there's research out there about how MariaDB is, is being used. We haven't yet drawn the conclusions for, from, from that to say, uh, identify exactly how, how to, uh, how, how the Stack Overflows research, for instance, what it means for our adoption. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, since those numbers are out there, uh, uh, they should at least be looked at and considered. Uh, popularity contests maybe aren't the best ways to measure all things, but it's good data to at least look at. Absolutely. So uh, we had um, openness, we had adoption, and the third and last is, is, is continuity. So uh, within this continuity, uh, there's, there's several goals that are probably a bit boring because they're internal to, to, to us in, in how to create uh, uh, the, the prerequisites for, for executing a long way into to have a, a thriving ecosystem mm -hmm. into, into the future. But one that's probably interesting for our viewers is to cultivate tomorrow's developers. So, Absolutely. And uh, what would be some ideas there? I mean, Google Summer of Code, unconferences, meeting again physically, I, I really miss that we haven't had uh, a, a real developer meeting uh, where uh, not only do we have all the developers from the MariaDB Corporation showing up as well as the foundation staff, but we get developers from some of the major contributors showing up as well, uh, and we get all the people in a room, and oh, things that come out of that are like instant ad column, which... which, which really came out of a discussion in one of those developer meetings. So, uh, and, and I, I want the opportunity to have those open uh, uh, conversations I, and, uh, and share each other's notions about what things we want to see change in the code base over time. And, uh, and this is going to be a tough one to do given travel and travel restrictions and such. Uh, so I think this is another area where we're going to have to learn how to do this in a hybrid fashion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have a, a confession to make, uh, at least towards, towards uh, you, whom, uh, whom I've been talking about the MariaDB University program for ages. And what has happened? Well, not much. <laughs> uh, so, so on that one, it's still an aspirational goal. And the, the issue here is, uh, people, so, so the, the idea with the university program is for us to uh, be the aggregator of classes around database tuition with MariaDB as an example. And, and it could very well be 
training materials for usage also outside universities. Mm -hmm. But we don't have the resources to develop them from scratch. Right. And what I've learned now is that that doesn't happen automatically uh, in such a way that, that we would ask University X to provide their classes and then uh, create a snowball on top of it. Uh, but we have some uh, some ideas on, on how this snow initial snowball could, could, could mm -hmm. happen. So, don't give up on that one. Okay. Well, I think, uh, indeed, the uh, getting getting the university program going is directly adjacent to cultivating tomorrow's developers. And it, it can start with cultivate, cultivating tomorrow's users. Yes. But, uh, but that's, that's, of course, uh, the large set. And from that large set, we get the next set in those are the people that are going to find reasons and ways to contribute and ultimately the next generation of developers uh, is a group we want to cultivate as well. And for the next generation of, of uh, developers to, to have a place to live we need to do something about the, the, the carbon imprint, the, 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 um. the climate catastrophe and, and uh, here I think that I mean, this is something that, that, that's truly exciting uh, from my perspective for, for next year to, to look at in which way MariaDB is, is uh, relevant to, to, to the climate. And, and the reason why I find it exciting is that there's no clear answer to it. It's, it's something that uh, I'm sure that IT has one of the largest impacts on the climate and lots of IT is database and lots of databases Maria did. So we do have an impact, but it's not clear how we impact this. So should we optimize to become even more faster or is there other things that we can do? And, and uh, I also have this not invented here hunch from, from, from others that Ah, so you're now trying to greenwash yourself and, 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 and trying to portray MariaDB as, as, a, a, as a climate friendly database and not do anything about it. Uh, because there's this logic that, of course, MariaDB is, is a performant database and, and if, if you get more transactions per second, you probably get more transactions per, per carbon dioc dioxide. So, um, I want to make sure that this is not a marketing thing where we uh, show ourselves as, as being uh, holier than thou. But I also am afraid of, or not afraid of, uh, absolutely not afraid, I'm even looking forward to those discussions because they are interesting. But I, I am expecting some resistance uh, from the opposite side saying, well, hey, we're a database and we're about performance and transactions and efficiency. It's none of our business, the, 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 the climate side. Uh, uh, you are striving to be overly politically correct if, if you want to sensitize uh, people to, to climate in the context of Maria Davis. So what's your take on that? Well, so, so first off, absolutely, the um, uh, I don't want to see anything that looks like market greenwashing. Um, I, but let's, let's talk about what we can see. Um, uh, I have a t-shirt I didn't wear it today. I wish I did. Um, I have a t-shirt, uh, which, uh, I got a few years ago that has, uh, uh, uh it says some like it hot. It has a competitor's database, uh, overheating and it, it has a, uh, a, a, um, uh, a Marie DB, uh, mascot keeping cool, uh, implying that, uh, that, that their servers are running cooler if they're running, uh, 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 really to be and and uh, and that was really about efficiency and uh, and we didn't see uh, a, a giant backlash to that of course and when I was working with uh, a very large e-commerce site when we talked about space in the data center we didn't mean physical space in the racks what we meant was power consumption and so we were saying this rack already has too many pizza boxes in it. We can't put any more in, not because there wasn't physical space, but because we couldn't get power to them. So the more we can do to reduce the power consumption footprint of these, these, uh, these servers that are out there, the more, the more we can process data, the savings is going to come to the large, uh, deployments. And so 
I think there's a real direct financial reason to prefer a database which is able to do more with less electrical power. Which in turn connects to the CO2 problems. So I don't think that we can conclude with any other continuity uh, aspirational goals that would be more important than that. So um, I'm happy with this. Any, any final words to conclude from your side? Uh, no, but uh, I, I do want to say thank you uh, for, for uh, doing this new, new effort of trying to draft aspirational goals as opposed to just the safe goals that we know we can hit. Um, and, uh, and I look forward to seeing how this draft evolves a little bit and what the impact is on the, uh, on the actual execution of the foundation in 2022. Then thanks, Eric, for, for igniting this being the impulse to, to, to get it done and for your contributions to it. So thank you. Absolutely. Okay. That was good. That was good. That was fun. <laughs> See, we can have fun. Yeah, we can have fun. And, and also, it's, I don't think that there was any, I mean, this was not, I think it was valuable and, and, and it was uh, almost effortless yeah. because we, we, uh, walked through it once beforehand, and mm -hmm. so there wasn't this giant amount of preparations to get mm -hmm. it well done. Mm -hmm. The giant amount of preparations was all the work that we put into this, mm -hmm. and, and, and then we just aired it. And, and then what was part of my thinking was that it couldn't be an interview, and this was not an interview. Mm -hmm. It was the first time that, that we've had a conversation in one of these mm -hmm. manifests, and I think. Yeah, let's see how let's see let's see how it lands with the uh, with the with the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good. So we can feel the rest. Then. Yeah. <sighs>so that was the chat with Eric and that also concludes the server mini fest from the front lines and we now did of course a bit of an experiment with a new format. We already heard from you that you don't dislike monologues, so we substituted that with dialogues and interviews, but now we interspersed these dialogues and interviews also with commentaries from the audience. This was an experiment, like uh, Eric put it. We'd like to hear what you think about it, so give your comments, please. And thank you for attending the Maria DB Server Minifest December 2021 edition. Bye.